spread out the skies over empty space. Said, Let there be light into a dark and formless world. Your light was born. You spread out your arms over empty hearts. Said, Let there be To a dark and hopeless world, your son was born. You made the world and saw that it was good. You sent your only son for you, our good. What a wonderful maker. Stick your whisper And how humble your love With a strength like no other And the heart of a father How majestic your whisper
breaks the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings, who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory. Above all kings, yeah, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You lay down your life that I would be set free. I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King above all kings. the nations with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of glory the king above all kings yeah, this is amazing grace this is our baby Awesome. Amen. And welcome here, everyone. Hello to those who have joined us on the live stream. Welcome. We are so glad that you are joining us. To the, all those who are here in person, I missed you. Finally. I, this is just such a, an amazing morning, and I'm so glad that we get to worship together and, um, yeah, just come and sit at the the feet of Jesus. A couple quick announcements. I want to invite everyone, whether you are, uh, if you are a kindergarten to grade six, we are planning our VBS. There's still room for participants. Please come. It's going to be so much fun. Games, snacks. We all know I love snacks. So please come. I know. 
uh, all the adults, grade seven and older, um, please come and be a part of our crew. Um, there's so much to be done and so much that um, we would love to share with you and to invite you to be a part of, whether it be a small group leader or helping us sanitize or um, helping feed kids who come hungry. There's so much to do and so much fun to be shared. So please sign up. Uh, you can find the link on our website or you can um, check the bulletin. There's a link there as well for uh, signing up as a participant or a volunteer. Uh, Another opportunity to join us and be part of this community is um, to join us for our Tuesday night prayers. There's a link in the bulletin to the Zoom link. Um, come and just pray with us and pray for our community, pray for each other. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's a great opportunity. Also, um, communion, communion is today. So if you are joining us at home, make sure to have those elements ready. For those who are here in person, if you did not get one on um, your way in, um, please uh, go to the back and they will have some there for you. Um, for those who are in-house, this is an uh, important announcement. Masks must be worn at all times, even when sitting. So please keep your masks on. Um, that is part of the restrictions that we currently have. Uh, and a reminder, at the end of the service, ushers will dismiss you at the end of the service. So don't run out. We will dismiss you safely and uh, distancely. So thank you so much. Back to you, Ryan. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. How we've missed you so much. There's so many people here now. I need to keep my eyes open to see you all. It's going to be great. It's great to hear all the chatter, see your faces, and to gather as a smaller community once again. I eagerly await the day when we don't have to wear masks and we can have everyone here with us. Hopefully soon. Uh, this morning I want to greet you from Matthew... 18, uh, and invite you into a space of worship this morning. It says, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. As we gather this morning, uh, for the first time in a long time, what feels like a long time, we know God is here, and we know he is with us, and I'm just so excited to worship with all of you this morning. So I invite you to stand, give a friendly wave to people sitting around, can't shake hands, but we can say hello. And let's sing together. We got a small team this morning, so I need your voices. just begun. Failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Say, failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Shame at the door, cause it ain't well. 
helpless come home. The helpless find hope. His love is on the moon when the father's in the room. Prison doors fling wide. The dead come to life. His love is on the moon when the father's in the room. Miracles take place. The cynical find pain. Jericho walls are quaking, strongholds now are shaking. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room.
child of God. Yeah, I'm no longer a slave to fear. Yeah, I am a child of God. And I'm no longer a slave to fear. Yeah, I am a child of God. Yeah, I am child of God and I am a child of God you may be seated My name is Georgia. And I'm Jenna. And today we're here to get to know each other a little bit better. Yeah, Georgia and I work together. She has been helping me with VBS. It's been awesome. She is so helpful and I'm so glad to have you a part of my team. <laughs> but as we've worked together, we have started to realize that we don't really know each other that well. So when I get to know someone, I like to ask them a few questions. So I thought that we could ask a few questions and just get to know each other a little bit. Awesome. And you guys at home can feel free to shout out your answers or you can type them in the chat and see if you have any of our answers too. Okay, everyone ready? What is your favorite color? Glitter. Brown. What is your favorite food? Uh, chicken nuggets. Salad. What is, what's your favorite animal? Oh, um, oh, cats. I like sharks. Okay, okay. Well, what do you like to do for fun? I like reading. Okay, um, I like swimming. So, it seems like we like different things but that's okay. What are we gonna do about it though? Well, this summer, our church family is going through one another lessons that God teaches us in the Bible. Let's see what today's lesson is about. Oops, I'm not a very good speller. Neither am I. We oh. can figure this out. Yeah, okay. Um, that goes there. Oh yeah, I think. Yeah. Oh, this is switched up. And this one too. One more. Okay. Awesome! <laughs> we figured it out. Look to the interests of others. Okay, now I'm lost. I don't get it. <laughs> well, do you remember the verse that Pastor Tom read us from Philippians 2 verse 4? Everyone should look not to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. Okay, so it's important to think of the things, not just what I like to do, but like what you like to do, even if I may not be good at them. Right, and you know what? When we read the Bible and see how Jesus loved others, you can see him doing that. Do you remember when Jesus met Zacchaeus? The people in Jericho didn't really like Zacchaeus because he was a tax collector and had a lot of money. But when Jesus passed through the town, he met with Zacchaeus and had a meal with him. Everyone thought this was crazy. Why would Jesus go and have a meal with someone that no one liked? Zacchaeus didn't put God first. He didn't really listen to the church. But Jesus still met with him and showed him love. Jesus was able to love Zacchaeus even though Zacchaeus wasn't loving others. With the meal that they shared together, they were able to find something that they had in common and liked to do and be together. Something that reminds me of me and Jenna is when Jesus met his first disciples. 
Jesus was walking by the sea, and he saw two fishermen. Jesus was a carpenter, so they might not have a lot in common. But you know what happened? The two fishermen got up from their boat and followed Jesus because they wanted to help him share God with others and share his love. One thing that really stood out to me is how Jesus was able to still follow God, but reach out to others who had different interests. Some people had different ideas of fun. Some of them didn't put God first. God was everything to Jesus. How on earth would he have something in common with them? Well, he found something that they both would enjoy, like a meal or sitting together or going for a walk. He was able to love them and share God's love through those experiences. And not only that, he was able to honor God while doing it. I feel like now I know what it means to look to the interests of others. Even if I don't have something in common with them, I can still love them like Jesus did. And maybe I can try something new with them. Well, if Jesus is gonna help me be brave and step out of my comfort zone, I can do anything. So Georgia, why don't you tell me something you like to do? Well. Okay, so we tried volleyball, and you, you did your best, but what would you like to do? Hmm. Like that? Yeah, sort of. So we tried volleyball. And we tried ballet. And you were pretty bad at volleyball. And your technique could use some work. We both got to learn a little bit more about each other. And we got to appreciate each other's skill. But I still feel like we can find something that we both like and have in common. Hmm. This is good. Mm. Mm -hmm. Whoa. Hi, sorry. Well, I hope me and my friend Georgia here inspired you guys to look to the interest of others and to maybe step out of your comfort zone and try new things. Sometimes doing something that you've never done before or something that another person is better at is kind of hard. It can be intimidating, but by us being willing to step out of our comfort zones and to try something new, it'll show the other person that they matter to us. Maybe it'll even help them feel comfortable opening up and talking about Jesus with us. Have a good week, everyone. Hope to see you at VBS. Bye. Bye. These are my favorite. Same. This is a time of the service when we normally take an offering, but uh, we won't be passing a basket. Feel free to drop in during the week, make a donation, or go online to the tab in, on our website and donate that way, recognizing that it's more than just keeping the lights on and welcoming people here in the sanctuary. It's about serving God. It's about loving others and keeping the interests of others, particularly their heart and their soul, in the forefront of our minds. Let's pray. God, we know you are here with us. In fact, sometimes we have the audacity to welcome you here in our midst. And while that's true, we recognize it's you that welcomes us. It's you that made us, brought us into being, and call us to you. We thank you that we've come so far. We thank you that restrictions are opening up and we're excited about greeting our family and friends. Help us, God, to in our excitement, not to forget, to be courteous, and kind, 
and careful to those around us. We thank you for all this, all that you've given to us, and we give back to you with our time, with our worship, with our service to others. We pray that you would bless it. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. tried so hard to see it It took me so long to believe it That you choose someone like me To carry your victory Perfection could never earn it You give what we don't deserve it Take the broken things and raise them to glory. You are my champion. The giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you won. I'm defeated. 
Good morning. Looks like I'll be preaching with this attached to my ear today because <laughs> it's not coming off. <laughs> times around. <laughs> Just in case you were wondering if we actually wear masks in here, <laughs> that was like somehow wrapped three times around my earpiece. I have no idea how that even happens. Ay, ay, ay. That was great worship, though. I don't have any problem at all going from worship to laughter, right? I think that actually really glorifies God, so. Oh, and I love hearing, I love hearing little voices in here. That's really good, too. All right, well, we are talking about looking to the interests of others today. And uh, I, we're going to start, I'm going to tell you about this, uh, we're going to ta- talk about the movie one-liner to start. I don't know if you've ever seen, show of hands in here, how many of you have ever seen the movie uh, Coach Carter? It's not one of those movies you have to be embarrassed to put your hand up about. <laughs> It's a very good movie. Now, before, before you go out and watch it with your kids, there is some language in it because they deal with a rough crowd in this movie. But the movie Coach Carter tells the story of a, of a man named Ken Carter who was a basketball coach in his old high school. It, it takes place in Richmond, California and around the year 1999. And he was very bothered by the poor attitudes of his players. They were from a rough background, rough neighborhood. And uh, so he imposes a strict regime, regime uh, that is typified or it's, it's written up in contracts. And these contracts for the players, if he's going to coach them, if they're going to be on the basketball team, he expects some things that he demands respectful behavior, a dress code, and good grades for the players. And there's a lot of resistance. There's a lot of resistance to that kind of rules and imposition at first, right? Because it's so foreign to the way that people typically live, with respect, with self-discipline, self-respect as well. And when the team does not obey, here he does, he locks the gym, says all sports are shut down until you guys get your grades up. And it outrages everyone. In fact, it outrages not only the team, but the school, the school administration, and the community, because they're really proud of their basketball team. Carter cancels all team activities, locks the door to the court, until the team shows acceptable academic improvement, and there's a debate. And Carter fights to maintain his methods. And you can just imagine, because it's a feel-good movie, that in the end, they come together. And they finally get what it means to be a team, and they sacrifice for one another, and they uh, get their grades up, and it's, it's a really good movie, and it's based on a true story. In one place, though, Coach Carter says this, we're a team. One person struggles, we all struggle. One person triumphs, we all triumph. You can't go it alone on a basketball court. It doesn't work that way. And there's a beautiful image there of the church. And when people hear the rules of the church, they're really just the rules of good human being. (laughs) They're just how to behave well and treat each other with respect. But sometimes we rebel because we live in a very individualistic world. And we don't like it. And can you imagine if the pastor locked the doors and said, until you guys start to behave and love one another, there's going to be no more team activities. Wow, what a debate would ensue. You know, the the Bible is filled with uh, illustrations of the benefit of teamwork. Now, I experienced this when I was in Bible school. I'm not an athlete. Um, That may not be patently obvious, but it's true. I'm not an athlete. uh, But I did learn a lot about teamwork when I went to Austria. And in fact, one of the things that I learned in Bible school in Austria was that I wasn't a very good team leader because I actually hadn't been on a lot of teams. Uh, But one thing that we did was we hiked the Dachstein uh, mountain range. And I'm going to show you some pictures here for just a moment. That's, That's me, by the way when I was slightly more athletic. Um, but in the background, you can see that, that sort of wide peak that's called the Dachstein. That's the highest vertical face in the, in the Austrian Alps. So it's 1,000 meters from where you see that sort of in, uh, that's gentle slope and there's a snow field. It's 1,000 meters from there to the top, all right? 
And so we didn't hike up the front because that would have been very difficult. We went around the backside and we came up some glaciers. Now I have a picture of the glacier. This is actually the second glacier we hiked on. Uh, we hiked up a glacier on, the, on one side, then we, then we summited the, the mountain, and I was right at the top of that peak. Uh, it was terrifying, because uh, at one point you could, you could literally go from looking 300 meters on this side down to the glacier, or 1,000 meters on this side down to your death. Actually, probably death on that side and death on this side, if I think about it. In any case, the, the interesting thing about this glacier is that it doesn't look like you would, might imagine a glacier, because it's covered with snow. And that's exactly the point. It is covered with snow. And that makes it particularly dangerous. Because underneath the snow in certain places, there are crevasses. They don't call them crevices, they're crevasses. And these are deep, wide cracks in the glacier that go all the way to the bottom in some cases. And it is, I think it was somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 meters or something like that. So can you imagine, you're walking along, and all of a sudden the snow beneath you crumbles, and you plummet. And because we were a Bible school, and they had some sense of the liability of this thing, they decided this was uh, not good. Actually, the, the, anybody who walks this glacier does this. What you do is, you get into your hiking team, and you put on your climbing harness, and then you rope yourself together with a long rope. And you, you space yourselves out, maybe, uh, maybe three meters in between each person. And that's how you walk down the glacier. And you can imagine if you, if, uh, if you, get one per, if you kind of slow down, you kind of get pulled along. It's very annoying. If, if you want to go faster, you have to wait for your whole team. But what happens is, if somebody on the team breaks through the snow and falls into a crevasse, this is what happens. Everybody kneels down. And because of the, the people that you're tied to, you won't fall very far. And so you put your knee down if somebody falls in, and the, the friction of the rest of the, of the team keeps you from falling to your death. Hans-Peter Royer, who was our director at the time, he said, look, if you fall in and you die, don't worry, you, you'll come out eventually in about 4,000 years at the bottom, because <laughs> the, the glacier moves very slowly, so it'll move your body slowly out. So we took it seriously. He had a very, very sick sense of humor. Um, I said, Hans Peter, have you ever fallen into a crevasse? And he said, only on purpose, Tom, only on purpose. <laughs> like, that's supposed to make us feel better. This is a good picture of how the body of Christ is supposed to look. We are tied together, and it's inconvenient. And some of us wish that we could move faster, and others wish that we could go a little slower. But the truth is that as we're tied together, we are safer. And when one suffers, we all suffer. When one triumphs, we all triumph. Let me tell you something. If we had gotten to the bottom of that glacier and some, we had lost somebody along the way because we hadn't tied in properly, there would have been incredible devastation. But as we got to the bottom, we went, this is incredible. Look what we've accomplished as a team. The same is true for the church. The Bible has dozens of verses about this concept. I mean dozens and dozens and dozens about being part of the household of faith, the body of Christ. In Ecclesiastes, it talks about a cord of three strands. You know, it's harder to break a cord of three strands than a single cord. There's so many beautiful images in creation you see this all over. You know, there's this famous illustration of the huge redwood trees in California. Those massive trees that some are so big you can drive a car under, into. They've carved tunnels in them. They're the kind of tree that in the legend of John Bunyan, they would say, it took seven men seven days to see the top. That's how big they are. And those giant redwood trees have a very it's kind of shallow network of roots. And they actually, what happens is you need a bunch of them together to mingle and, and tie their roots together so that they'll become strong. It's a beautiful image. Or you have, you know, the typical geese fly, flying in formation, you know? Now, there's always a time in everybody's journey when you have to go it alone. There are things where you have to move at your, you have to do something, you have to step out in faith. Maybe the community doesn't even really understand it. There are times for that. But I will tell you this. Whenever you go it alone, no matter how right it is, it is way harder than going together. 
So even, it's, even though it's true, there are times when like Jesus, well, hopefully not like Jesus, but there are times when even Jesus, who had a team around him, was alone. And he went out alone and it was very, very difficult. And he was disappointed with his closest friends when they were sleeping in his hour of need. Life is lived richer in community. But not just any kind of community. It's got to be a community that's known for this, like, tangible otheredness, other centeredness. That's what we read in Philippians 2, verse 4. Everyone should look to the, not to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. So, just like the community of believers, the one another's we've been talking about should be marked by humility to learn from another, forgive one another, love one another. It should be marked by a desire to put one another's interests above our own. Literally, we should care more about the other people sitting around us or in our, uh, watching from home today than we care about our own interests. That's literally what it's saying. And you know, as I was preparing this message this week, I just went, oh my goodness, this is such a condescending message. Like, it's, it's, almost, it's almost impossible to, to say these things without having a patronizing tone. And, and I was thinking about this, like, there's a sense in which it's so patently obvious that in the church we should treat each other well. And it's like, why? Do we, <laughs> do we really have to remind ourselves of this? It reminds, me, it reminds me of, you know, my mom, you know, can't you guys just get along? Like, we know we're supposed to get along as a family. We don't. <laughs> Gordon Neufeld, who's a who's a, a family psychologist, he said once, if you find yourself saying, I've told you a million times, maybe try saying it in a different way. Because <laughs> the kids aren't learning. So maybe we need to talk about this in a different way so that we get better at looking to the interests of others. See, to me this feels different than the, you know, forgive one another message because forgiving one another is actually really hard. So we need to wrestle through that. And I think about it, you know, I, I, the, to look to the interests of others. Why is that a one another that we have to talk about? Isn't this, isn't this obvious? Isn't it just rudimentary, right? And yet we don't accept it. We don't get it. And worse than that, we actually are kind of self-righteous about it. We do these things like we read about the Israelites in the Exodus, right? And you, you look at these, we, I mean, the, one of the most scoffable moments of the entire Exodus story comes when they have literally seen God deliver them miraculously, like m- numerous times over in, in, through the plagues, the plagues which defeated all of the Egyptian gods. And then, they, and then they escape from Egypt, and Pharaoh comes after them, and this cloud separates them while they're at the Red Sea, and then God miraculously splits the sea. They walk through, he defeats the Pharaoh's army as they get stuck in the, the sand and the mud. And then on the other side, they get a little thirsty, and they're like, Moses, we were better off in Egypt. <laughs> ah! <laughs> you know? You've got to be kidding me! <laughs> I can just hear Moses right now. We're very hard on them, aren't we? Many times they're called a stiff-necked people. Obstinate. And we feel really good about ourselves. Until there's a kid crying in the back row who is interrupting our ability to enjoy the message. And then suddenly we turn around and we find our neck is a little stiff too. Because we're not actually looking to the interests of others. And we can scoff at the Israelites and their foolishness or what we perceive as foolishness. But actually in a church, we do these things. We cast looks at each other. We make people feel less than. We exclude. We got cliques. I was a junior high pastor here. Then I was a middle school pastor. Do you know what I find very interesting? Middle schoolers get ragged on for being cliquey. Humans are cliquey. We define ourselves by what we like and we exclude that which we don't. But what does it mean? We're supposed to look not only to our interests. We're supposed to put the other's interests ahead of ourselves. So we believe that. We nod along with the, with the message. We nod along with the children's. You know, the children especially need this, right? <laughs> they need the lesson. Put others ahead of yourself. And then we get mad because the the music doesn't match our particular taste. And you know, I sometimes wonder, is is our faith really so fragile that if we don't do the kind of music that we like, our preference, that we're unhappy? 
You know, every time I sit in church and the music doesn't connect with me, I'm happy. Because what, I'm ti- uh, what I tend to do is I look around at the people it is connecting with. And do you know what I find? They're younger than me and they need a different kind of connection than I need. Believe me, I love hymns. I'm kind of old-fashioned that way. I love hymns. And thank goodness they're, they're, they're coming back. I like that. But the hymns they sing these days, come on, they sound different. <laughs> we, were just, we had some friends over last night and we were discussing our tastes in music. I, I'm an, I like opera. <laughs> I just kind of do. I'm sorry if that offends you. I'm, I'm old that way, right? Jenna's nodding. Thank you. I like the classics. You know what's interesting? I heard this on CBC Radio a few years ago. There were, there were two composers, Bach. There's two Bachs, right? Am I getting that right? Two Bachs? One, there was a father and a son, Bach. One was Johann Sebastian, and the other one was the other one, and I can't ever remember which one is which. But one of them was famous. First, the dad. He wrote all these, he composed all these great, you know, all this orchestral music, and he was, you know, he wrote all this church music, and it was amazing. Do you know that when his son started writing, you know, the music, do you know that the first, the first public appearance that he gave, people were scandalized at how the music sounded? It was too loud. It grated on our ears. Today we listen, it's just all classical. It grates on everybody's ears. <laughs> but in those days, it was new. And because it was new, it was hard. But when I don't like the music, or if I feel uncomfortable, I just look around and go, oh, other people are engaging. Awesome, that's what church is about. We look to the uh, interests of others. You know, I was reflecting this week on the Old Testament and the many, many laws that were in the Old Testament. There were 613 Levitical laws. That's how many there were. Now, there were different categories of Levitical laws. But I don't think we realize how countercultural these laws were. You see, we read uh, the golden rule, right? And we say, oh, Ma- uh, um, Jesus said the golden rule in Matthew, in Matthew 22, verse 39. That's where he talks about the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you, right? But did you know that the golden rule, like Jesus is just quoting a Levitical statement, a law, that's all he's doing. In Leviticus 19, verse 18, it says, do not take... <clears throat> Do not take revenge or bear a grudge against members of your community, but love one and love your neighbors as yourself. I am the Lord. Now think about that. God requested that Moses write down that you are to love your neighbor, and 1,500 years later, Jesus is reminding people that they still need to love their neighbor. 1,500 years between Moses and Jesus, the message hasn't changed. <clears throat> Then you read the letters that the apostles write to the churches. And what do they say? Love your neighbor. Love one another. Put the interest of others. It says this in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1 to 3. And this, by the way, is a section called the problem of immaturity. This is what Paul is saying to the church in Corinth. For my part, brothers and sisters, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as babies in Christ. I gave you, I gave you milk to drink not solid food, since you were not yet ready for it. In fact, you still are not ready because you are still worldly. For since there is envy and strife among you, you are not, you are not worldly. You are, you are you not worldly and behaving like mere humans, mere humans. And it offends our sensibilities. Paul, oh, we think, good thing we're not that Corinthian church. You know, it offends us. Do you understand what's happening? Oh, James, I should go over James then. James says in chapter 4, you desire and do not have, you murder and covet because you cannot, cannot obtain, you fight and war, you do not have because you do not ask, you ask and don't receive because you ask with the wrong motives so that you may spend it on your own sinful desires, right? And then he says, adulteresses, don't you know that uh, friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Therefore, anyone who wants to become the world's friend must become an enemy of God. But the way that starts is, do you know why, do you know what the source of wars and fights is among you? It's the cravings at war within you. In other words, the more we feed the cravings and the, and, and the, the selfishness within us, the more there are fights and wars outside of us. So get yourself under control, get your passions and di- desires under control, and guess what? There's going to be more peace among us. This is, this is what it means to be mature. In fact, he says, some of you are not getting your prayers answered because of this immaturity. 
Think about that. That's an incredible thought. Do you see what's going on here, though? Moses in Leviticus says, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says in Matthew, love your neighbor as yourself. Paul says in Corinthians, you're acting immaturely when you behave with envy and strife, i.e. you're not putting others ahead of yourself, your other's interests ahead of your own. James says, the worldly cravings in your heart cause you to fight with each other. And then Paul says it again to this time to the Ephesians, look to the interests of others. 1,500 years between Moses and Jesus, 2,000 years between Jesus and us, and we still need the message. Because we still don't quite get it. Because human nature is naturally self-centered. And Jesus is saying, this isn't the way it should be. And of course, there's those people, I mean, I've heard this before too. Yeah, but aren't those people who are offended? Aren't they just being sensitive? Yeah, maybe. But what difference does that make if they're sensitive? In Romans 15, verse 1, to two, 1 and 2, it says, now we, have, now we who are strong have an obligation to bear, we, bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not to please ourselves. Each one of us is to please his neighbor for his good to build him up. So those of us who have been Christians for longer should even more so should even more so look to the interests of others. We should be casting a good example for those who come after us. Now, don't hear me wrong. If you're a baby in the faith, you're you're new to Christianity, or you're a, a young person in this room, you are also supposed to do this. We're all supposed to do this. But those of us who are strong, in other words, those of us who have been in the faith for a long time, are meant to be obviously looking to the interests of others. Obviously. The fact, is you can't, the fact that you can't please everyone doesn't mean that you shouldn't make an effort. In Hebrews 12, verse 14, it says, Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, holiness no one will see the Lord. Well, that's true. And then people say, yeah, but didn't, didn't Paul say in Corinthians that the gospel is foolishness to the perishing? Yeah, he did say that. 1 Corinthians 2. He said that. But you know what's offensive to the world out there? Not our behavior, but the one we follow. There is a big difference between offending people and the gospel being hard for the world to swallow. Huge difference. That's not on us. We're supposed to preach a morality, a biblical worldview, and if people have trouble understanding that, or if that's offensive, that's not on us. But when it comes to preferences, and which Bible translation we use, and which songs we sing, those are not the things that define what is supposed to be offensive in the church. And this is the strange paradox. The strange paradox of living this way is that the more we realize our interconnectedness And the more we reject individualism, the stronger we get as individuals. That's fascinating. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 26, a famous verse, it says, So if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice. Think about that. When's the last time you were offended for somebody you go to church for because they were being maligned in the marketplace? We are suffering with each other and honored with one another. How many times do you share in the honor of somebody when they make it onto the news for something spectacular they've done? Do you feel a sense of pride or do you feel a sense of jealousy? You see, we're to suffer with those who suffer and we are to feel honored with those who are honored. And this is brilliant because when you reject individualism and support others in their grief and joy, guess what? When it's your time to have grief and it will come you will have the support of your community around you. And I've lived this, by the way. I lived through the flood of the century, 1997. I was 17 years old. I have a picture for you of our farm, our family farm. It's the one on the lower uh, left-hand side there. <clears throat> my, my parents' house is the house uh, sort of in, the, uh, in that little square at the top. That dike that we have, and we have a dike, we have a huge dike. My dad said after the 1979 flood, foolishly, dad, he said, if the water ever gets as high as this dike, I'm going to sit on the top and fish off it. 
I tell you something, he was not fishing in 1997. <laughs> We were sandbagging. That dike is half a mile around. If you walk it twice, you've walked a mile. And, eat, and that white line, those are sandbags. And those sandbags, there were 40,000 of them. It took, us, it took us four days to get that, that, um, that sandbag dike completed, and the water came halfway up the sandbags. And by the way, those chicken barns, they kept the chickens in there. There were 17,000 chickens in there. Can you imagine that mess if they had all drowned? Oh, my word. It's also a lot of eggs to gather by yourself when you can't get the help in. Do you know, who, you know who helped us with that? The church. For four days straight, we never had less than 50 people at a time working to save our farm. Four days, never less than 50 and often more than that. And you know who, were, you know who the hardest workers were? The Hutterites. Oh my goodness. They came out they were throwing sandbags. I, I, I remember thinking as a 17-year-old, does that guy have muscles or grapefruits in his arms? Like, they were so strong and they worked so hard. And why? Because my dad, before he was a farmer, was a sales feed, uh, uh, a feed salesman. And he sold them feed and he had a relationship with them. And if you know anything about Wally Dick, he is a relational man. And when it came time for him to need something... His feed clients, customers, were lining up to help him because they knew Wally. That, and I remember my dad saying, Tom, I don't know how, I don't have any idea how somebody would do this without the help of a church. I just don't know. We would have lost the farm without a church and without Christians. There are 613 Levitical laws in the Old Testament. What was their purpose? The purpose was to set apart Israel so that when people looked at Israel, they said, that, that nation is different. What is different about them? They treat each other different. They act different. I want to know who their God is. You see, the purpose of the laws was to set apart the nation so that other nations would want their God. And remember, it was in Leviticus that we were told the first time to love our neighbors. You know why they were said to love their neighbors? I think that all the Levitical laws could be summed up in one sentence. I think it was God saying, be different because I am different. Amen. Be different. He says, be holy as I am holy. Holy means set apart, just be different. Be different because I am different. We often think of being set apart as being isolated. That is so wrong. It's not about seclusion. It's not about isolating ourselves from the world. It's about being different because he is different. So different that the world wants what we have and yet they don't know what it is. Matthew, in Matthew 22, Jesus was just repeating that verse from Leviticus. Love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, he's saying still be different. Still be different. And do you know what? This is, this is what I want you to think about. You see, I think for, uh, for a long time we were maybe right in the church to say we want to be known as people who love Jesus. Oh, we just want to be known as people who love Jesus. And you know what? We should be known as people who love Jesus. But you know what the problem is? The world actually doesn't care that we love Jesus. They don't. They look to our behavior before our belief. So if you want them to love the Jesus you love, don't be famous for loving Jesus. Be famous for loving others. I think that, I think that um, by the way, I think that a lot of people in the church really get this. R really, for a lot of people, this is just like, ah, yes, that's why we do what we do, right? Th I mean, this week I'm convicted. You know, I'm thinking of all the ways that I haven't put my family first or I haven't put, you know, the people in the congregation first, you know, because I had a busy week. And yeah, I'm thinking about all that. But really, a lot of us live this. We know this to be true. So now we remember why. The world doesn't care that you love Jesus. They look at your behavior before they look at your belief. That is just the truth. So how are you behaving? See, I wish for Eastview that you would be famous as the church that loves one another. Because that is different. There's communities all around here that you can be part of that do not exemplify that. 
that love for one another. I always tell people when they ask, you know, where I'm working or where I did work, I always say, you know those two churches on the, on the North Perimeter? Oh, yeah, yeah, I know that. The one with the green roof. <laughs> I always say that. It's the one with the green roof. That's where I work. I wish I could say, you know those two churches on the North Perimeter? It's the one that's famous for the way they treat other people. Oh, yeah, I know which church you're talking about. Wouldn't that be amazing? We're going to take communion in a second. I'm going to invite the band to come up. I remember in the MB church that I grew up in, because uh, we passed the elements at those times, right? So you had these silver trays, these beautiful silver trays with the glass cups that clinked so beautifully. (laughs) I love that. But what we were always instructed to do, I remember this so distinctly, the, the, the pastor, it was probably, I remember Pastor Rick McCorkendale. He would say, before you take, serve your neighbor. So as the element came through, you know what we were practicing? Looking to the interests of others before our own. Communion celebrates the other-centeredness of even our Savior, who looked to our interests before his own. That's what Philippians 2 is all about. He was different. We are to follow in his footsteps. Today, as we take communion, I would encourage you to consider how are you going to be different? What is the the thing that, who's the person that you need to maybe apologize to? Maybe you need to say in your own heart, I am going to determine in my heart that as we start to meet in person again, I'm just not going to be that guy that I was. I'm not going to be the one who frowns when the music changes that I don't like. I mean, it's so practical. It's so very practical. I'm going to be the one who gets up out of church and scoops up the little baby crying in the back row because their mom and dad haven't sat in church for a very long time. Who's that going to be, right? It's very practical. And I promise you that as you do those little steps, you know what's going to happen? The community will notice and they're going to want the God that you know. Let's worship that God through communion. Uh, For those of us who have these little cups in here, what you want to do is you just want to bend that tab down and it'll release the cellophane so that you can open it up and eat the, the element that is the bread. Now just hold on one second because we're going to do that together. And I want to read to you a famous passage that you know. But by the way, this passage is sandwiched in between Paul talking to the church in Corinth about divisions. He says, you're not treating each other well. Now let's have communion. And then he reminds them, now you should probably behave again. <laughs> The very, this story that we read all the time, we don't realize it's meant to bring unity to a divided church. That's what communion is meant to do. It's meant to remind us about the others that we are with. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant established by my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Our Lord Jesus Christ, I pray God that, well, first of all, I thank you that you use us because we're really, really, we're a real messy people. We are equally as messy as the Israelites complaining in the desert after they just saw miracle upon miracle. We're equally messy. But you're choosing to use the church as your body to affect change in the world. 
And so, Father, for all of us who have this belief, this belief in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I pray that our behavior would match our belief so that the world would come to know you and come to know the God who changes hearts. Jesus, you have rescued me from so much, so, so, so much. My life could have gone so many different ways. And you have given me such purpose. And I want my friends, my church family to know that purpose. Jesus, I pray that you would speak to us in our thoughts, whisper into our hearts, show us passages in your word this week of what you want for us to do next so that we would grow as a community closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand with us for our final two songs? Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. to the altar the father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of jesus is calling bring your sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling oh come to the altar the Father's arms are Born with the precious blood of Jesus Oh, yeah. 
arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with The precious blood of Jesus Christ Oh, come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Bear your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found.
Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. And you are way maker, miracle work, promise keep. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Finally, church, may the God of endurance and encouragement give to you or grant you to live in such harmony with one another that together you may with one voice glorify God the Father, your Lord Jesus Christ. Go in peace.